Mm -hmm. <coughs> I heard a cough. Yes, that was me. Well, that's good because I couldn't see you. I was listening to a news report from uh, Ukraine. Oh, that's depressing. I've been watching that all morning too. Uh, it's horrible. But then it was like, hang on, that didn't sound like it fit that audio. So um, we're recording now, but I'm going to pause for a second. Um, Elliot and I just had a meeting earlier, which was phenomenally interesting. And um, one of the things that came up was documents in VR. So hence, he's joining us here today. And uh, hi, Gavin. Nice to meet you before everybody comes in. Fabian is here. And we'll see who else joins us today. Yeah, pleasure to be here. I was just talking to um, a bunch of uh, very powerful and interesting and wonderful people in the field of huge repositories of important scientific, academic, and medical literature. And towards the end of the call, we talked about what happens to documents in a virtual environment. And um, they became a bit shocked, like I think we have become as we've gone into it ourselves. Hi, Alan. Um, just um, mentioning, Alan, when Elliot and I had a meeting with some people earlier today about they have a huge repository of scientific, academic, and medical information, and how when we started talking about uh, virtual environments, the issues of ownership and where thing you know technical ownership and so on became interesting to them. So. That's why Elliot is here as well. Hi, Elliot. Hi, guys. Where are you all from? Are you, uh, are you uh, European, American, or a mixture, or what? Uh, well, I'm, from, I'm in uh, Brooklyn. Oh, I, used to, I was born in Brooklyn. All right. <laughs> there was something about you. I said, this guy's probably, <laughs> probably neighbors. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm uh, personally in Austin, Texas, born and raised in Dallas, Fort Worth area. And then uh, our company, Immerse, is HQ down here in Austin, Texas. Nice to meet you. Fabian, you're in Brussels, right? Are, are you from Brussels or where are you from, Fabian? No, I'm from France, um, from Bretagne. So it means uh, I don't mind the shitty weather of Brussels. It's spelled the same. Some of the rainiest place on earth, I guess. Gives me more time to be in VR. Fair point. Uh, I'm in London, uh, in, in Wimbledon in London. Elliot was kind of, it's funny when you American people talk about Europe, like it's one thing. Obviously <laughs> this week, it's kind of emotional to be told, you know, we are in Europe, considering it's not one thing at the moment. Yeah. Just went to pick up my son at school, and the school principal sent out a letter saying there has there is one family directly affected. Our close friends here have family 30 kilometers from the border. Mm. So it's... Um, it's uh, I, I can, I'll speak on behalf of the whole country, because that's always a good idea. Uh, it's hitting us pretty close to home here as well, uh, fr from from the sense of there are a lot of Ukrainians and Russians here, I'm mm -hmm. friends with a lot of them, and mm -hmm. from the sense of mm -hmm. I, I, uh, 
there's a ton of uh, coworkers that are in the Ukraine office and uh, there's a ton of tech in Ukraine. So like mm -hmm. it's a common occurrence to, mm -hmm. to interact with Ukrainians. And um, yeah, oh, it's pretty stunning what's going on. Yeah, it's tragic what's happening. I see Brenda is, is joining us, which is good. Yeah, I mean, it's so many layers. Like one of our close friends now, he was the one who did the renovation of our house. So he's a builder. And only after years after that became quite close because he has children the same age as, as our son. We find out that him and his wife, they were studying aeronautical engineering. That's like a normal thing in Ukraine. The education level is just so high. You know, but they decided they needed to leave for other reasons. Hey, Brandel. Don't know how many else there will be today. I think Mark has connection issues and Peter has parental issues. So, um, Gavin, do you want to do any preamble before we start? Also, please, um, uh, particular to you, Gavin, this will be transcribed and put in our journal. So mm -hmm. despite the tiny audience today, you are not speaking into a void. No worries. Glad to be here regardless. And so, sure, I can just do a quick introduction to myself and maybe be helpful if we run around and did some quick intros too so I can have a better idea of... Uh, you all's organization and groups. So I did some research reading on the website, but uh, my name is Gavin. Uh, I work here in Immerse. I've been here for about two years and I essentially lead all of our revenue um, and business development operations here. I work closely with our founder and CEO on basically everything in the company. I was a seventh hire and kind of considered along with our founding team as a mini co-founder. And so very familiar with the Immerse platform and then the mission of, of what we're building in the, the VR AR space, as well as Metaverse Crypto as well, which we can talk on later. Um, and yeah, today I'm going to be talking about Immerse, so when I can have a quick presentation discussing what we're doing, um, but also would love, um, I guess, some more feedback too of open, candid conversation. I know you have some questions you want to ask about this idea of working in the metaverse, 2D, going from 2D to VR, AR, the implications it could have. So be working in the VR space, very familiar with the technology and the implications of what we think is coming. I work closely, very directly with Meta, HTC, Microsoft, as well as the future Apple. So pretty, pretty um, ingrained in the market on understanding what's coming. And so, yeah, so if we can give a quick presentation from Immerse, but maybe just go around, do a quick round of introductions to be, be helpful for me. Sure. Okay, I'll start. Um, this group is, we've had a, over 100 of these meetings now. Um, every Monday, Friday, it started as an outgrowth of the annual symposium on the future of text. We've got two books published. We've now started a journal. The journal will be collated into a book at the end of the year. We are passionate about text and currently we are really living in VR land. Um, the, the guys will introduce themselves in a minute, but from my perspective, what I'm really strongly focused on is the lack of imagination around this. We're focused on work in VR. And I'm really, to put it plainly, shit scared that in a year or two with Apple and other advanced devices out there, people will think that it's basically a meeting room and a game, and that's about it. So we're trying to look at ways of making working collectively and individually in VR something else and we're doing it just as an open group of people doing demos and yeah, figuring it out together. Um, okay, who's next? Well, I'm Elliot Siegel and the repository that uh, Freud uh, mentioned was the National Library of Medicine. Uh, I was an executive with NLM for 35 years. I retired in 2010 and uh, continued working with them as a consultant and I still have involvement with them. And uh, so I basically uh, was interested in uh, kind of matchmaking an arrangement with uh, Freud and Vinsurf and uh, in my old organization. So the as I'm called this morning, uh, this, this subject came up and intrigued me. And I, I must confess, I feel very intimidated. I'm obviously seven, several generations apart from you guys. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's quite impressive. And, uh, my son, who's in his early 40s, uh, is, is an Oculus user and uh, has uh, said, Dad, you know, you've got to try this out. And I'm thinking, what the hell am I going to do with it? You know, I'm not a gamer. And uh, so I'm looking for, they want to give me an 80th birthday present. This might be it. But I first have to find out whether there's a use for, for me beyond playing games. I did experiment with Second Life, by the way. That was probably before you guys were born. 
and I did bring that into NLM. We did some you know, some work uh, applications with that. So uh, I do have an interest in in VR, and uh, so I'm here to learn. I've got a phone call coming in any at any time. I may have to get off at that point, but I'll listen for as long as I can. Thank you. Welcome. It's exciting to have somebody with a deep domain knowledge and an awareness of of what kind of problems need to be solved in, in, in such an important and serious space as the NIH. Um, my name is Brandel. Uh, I uh, am the, the person who said the cat amongst the pig pigeons somewhat within the Future of Text group. Um, I'm a, a creative technologist working for Big Tech in Silicon Valley, um, uh, and but very much here in a personal capacity. Uh, something that I've been very uh, passionate about trying to uh, investigate and play with over the last 10 years or so is what is the most pedestrian thing that you can do with virtual reality and emerging technology in my opinion of that um, was uh, was word processing was reading and reading and thinking about what are the, the basic building blocks of that process of writing and reading that can fundamentally be changed by uh, by virtual reality realizing that if you don't have a screen, you have um, the ability for information to mean what it means for your purposes rather than for the technical limitations that apply as a consequence of a mouse or a keyboard or things like that. Um, and uh, also deeply invested in uh, understanding some of the emerging cognitive science and, uh, and neurophysiological um, sort of uh, views about what it is that the mind is and the way that we work best. So uh, uh, reading about and learning about uh, what people call 4E cognition, that's um, embedded, embodied, inactive, and extended mind, uh, and how that might pertain to what we should be doing with software and systems, uh, both as well as hardware if necessary, um, uh, to, to make it so that we can, we can think properly and express properly and, and stuff. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm here, and that's uh, what I've been playing with, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing uh, what you've got. Gavin. Randall, I finally have a bio for you now. That was wonderful. Um, I'll jump in because I'm here thanks to uh, Randall, and I think we have uh, some uh, similar profile. Uh, I'm a, a prototypist. Uh, I, I started a little while ago, 15 years ago or less, uh, in uh, any kind of substrate and transitioned to a wiki. And now I'm basically bringing that wiki to VR and AR. Uh, and I say this because there were quite a, there were a lot of people getting excited by VR, but few who think uh, not games, <laughs> uh, to, to paraphrase Elliot, uh, is interesting. And I think it goes uh, a lot further than this. And I have an actual illustration for this because I had a, a discussion this morning with a friend. Nice. It's a bit of a mess. <laughs> yeah. But let me step back. Uh, Nice. So it looks a bit like a city, uh, and it's basically a representation of part of my mind through my notes of a 3D space that can be navigated in VR. Uh, to be fair, I don't know what I'm doing, uh, literally, that I, I really don't know how to do this. Um, so I'm just tinkering, building prototype here, sharing very candidly and naively what I build with uh, everyone, because I believe I'm, I'm quite eager to hear the opinion, the criticism. Uh, and I'm, I'm genuinely convinced, uh, and also as Brendan highlighted, that the neurological aspect, how we move in space, can greatly benefit from the new medium. But like I said, very candid about it, I, I can tinker, I can code, but I don't know how to do this right. Uh, you do know what you're doing, but that's another discussion right there. Um, Alan. Yes, hey, hello, uh, I'm Alan. I work at Twilio, which is a, an SMS and sort of multi-channel company. Uh, and uh, I work there because of my, my interest in the various forms of text and communication. Um, Twilio is unique in that it's probably the closest to a kind of a ubiquitous governance model 
in that uh, most of my job, oh, my job switches between technology and policy. Um, the the interest uh, why I'm here, and and how I think it it dovetails nicely with VR is, uh, as uh, as Brandel said, you know, embodied uh, enacted cognition. When is uh, text the most natural way to communicate versus other uh, visual forms or interactive forms? I think there's a, a lot of potential there at the same time that, that we're in the middle of, a, of, a, of a, a shared experience where we can't even uh, seem to agree on the same definitions of words or um, uh, get excited almost about, to, uh, about technology without looking at the, the base misunderstandings at the word level. So um, that's... That's why I'm here. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, Bob just disappeared again. I'm not sure if we're Bob. Can you hear us? Are you Are you there? Okay. Um, yeah, Bob. Um, right. So, Gavin, uh, did you want to do a screen share? You're welcome to do that or talk or however. Mm -hmm. But before you do that, just a quick um, check. Everybody here knows what Immersed is, and you've at least tried it or something similar, right? Uh, I know what it is, but I'd love a, a general description for the recording. Mm -hmm. Yep, more than happy to talk through it. Um, and so it seems like each of you are VR users to some extent on a Quest 2 or an HTC device or something. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Or has anyone here never used VR before? Uh, Bob, have you used VR recently within the last few years? You haven't, right? Not yet. Bob, Bob uh, you mute, muted, Bob. But um, Bob is, um, has a long history making information, information murals. And uh, Brandel has been working on putting those into VR. So cool. that's the perspective and, and wisdom of, uh, of Bob, who's not in VR yet, but he will be soon. So please awesome. continue, Gavin. Awesome, of course. Well, thanks everyone for the introduction. It's an honor to be here and, and chat with each of you about Immerse. So kind of what I think I'd like to do with our time is I can give a high level description of Immerse. I actually would like to also show you a video to help uh, encapsulate what the experience looks like. And so for each of you who have used Immerse, are very familiar. For those of you who haven't checked out Immerse, I think our video that our, our marketing team put together is very helpful just to the high level. And then I can just kind of walk through a, a basic slide deck that I like to show companies and showcase the value a little bit. It's a little bit more on the sales side. I can assure you this is not a sales pitch, but I think it should be helpful to showcase some, some of the value that we have. Um, we've thrown something. A little bit of an intro is nice, but considering that the experience is quite deep in general, and also because it will be recorded, if you can do kind of a compressed <laughs> intro and then we go uh, into questions and, and deeper, that would be really great. Okay, yeah, no, we can definitely do that. Um, so to, to go on an intro, so Immersed is, we're a virtual reality products, working productivity software, and so we make virtual offices. And so what that means is uh, Merce is kind of broken down into two categories, in my opinion. We have a solo use case, and then we have a um, collaboration meeting use case. So the main feature that we have in Immerse is the ability to bring your computer screen, whether you have a Mac, a PC, or a Linux, into virtual reality. So whatever is on your computer screen is now brought into Immerse. And we've created our own proprietary technology to virtualize extensions of your screen, very similar to if you had a laptop or a computer at your desk and you plugged in extra physical monitors for more screen real estate, we've now virtualized that technology. And it's proprietary to us and we're the only ones in the world who can do that. And then, so now in Immersed, instead of you working on one screen, so for example, I use a MacBook Pro for work. So instead of me working on one MacBook Pro with an Oculus Quest 2 headset or a compatible headset, I can connect it to my computer, have an Immersed software on my computer and my headset, bring my screen into virtual reality, have the ability to maximize it to the size of an iMac screen. I can shrink it and then create up to five virtual monitors around me for a much more immersive work experience for your 2D screens. More so, and you can also have your own customized avatar that looks like you, uh, and you can beam into all of these cool environments that we've created. Think of them as like higher fidelity, higher quality video game atmospheres, but not like a game, but the more professional environments. But we also have some fun, more gaming environments or space station offices or like a space orbitarium, auditorium. 
Uh, we have like a, something called the Alpine Chalet, like a really beautiful ski lodge. Uh, really, the creativity is endless. And so within all of our environments, you can work there and you can also meet and collaborate with people as other avatars. Instead of us meeting here on Zoom where we're having a 2D, very disconnected experience. I'm sure each of you have probably heard of the term Zoom fatigue or video conference fatigue. That's been very real, especially with the COVID pandemic. And so fortunately, that's hopefully going away and we can have a little bit more in office interactions, but we believe immersed is the perfect solution for uh, hybrid and remote working. It's the best tech bridge for recreating that sense of connection with people. And that sense of connection has been very valuable for a lot of organizations that we're working with as well. And it's enhancing the collaboration experience from our monitor tech and our screen sharing screen streaming technology. And so uh, people use it for the, the value that people get out of it is that people find themselves more productive when working in immersed um, because now they want to have more screen real estate, like all the environment we've created and intentionally created to help increase your cognitive focus. So I have lots of news for customers and users who tell us that when they're immersed, they feel hyper-focused, more productive in a state of deep work, flow, whatever term you want to use. And people are progressing through the work faster and feel less distracted. Uh, and then just also in general, more connected because when you're in VR, it really feels like you have a sense of presence when you're sitting across from a table from another avatar that's your friend or colleague. And that really boosts uh, employee and person satisfaction, connection, just for an overall engaging, better collaborative experience when working remotely. Any questions around what I explained or what Immersed is? Super naively, um, when you say screen sharing, for example, here I'm using uh, Linux. Is it compatible with Linux? Or is it just Windows or Mac OS? Is it web-based? Mm -hmm. So it is compatible with Linux. And so right now uh, you can have virtual monitors with Linux through a, a special extension that we've created. We're still working on developing the virtual display tech to the degree we have for Mac and Windows. Because this is only one of two percent of our user base. And so for us as a business, we obviously have to optimize for our, our, most of our users uh, since we are a venture back startup. Uh, but that's coming in the future. And then you can also share screens though with Linux. And so with the, some of the extensions you can use for having multiple Linux displays, you can share those screens as well within Immersed. Uh, that's great. Yeah, this is really impressive. This is a question that may be more of a theme uh, to get into later, mm -hmm. but I, I definitely mm -hmm. see the philosophy of starting with where, where work is happening now and kind of like uh, like the, the way that you'd make a train tracks, you know, bringing bits and pieces into VR so that you know you can get bodies in there i'm mm -hmm. curious as to once that's happened or once you feel like you've got that sufficiently covered uh is there a a next step is there a, a um what would you want the uh collaborative space in vr to look like that is unlike anything that we have in the real world um versus yeah, I just, I, I'd love to know where you stand kind of philosophically on that, as well as whatever the roadmap is. Sure. So if I'm understanding your, your question properly, it's how do we feel about how we see the evolution of VR collaboration versus in-person collaboration? And if we see there's going to be an inherent benefit to VR collaboration as we progress versus in-person? Yeah, there's, there's that part. And there's also the kind of like, is the main focus of the company to uh replicate and provide the affordances that we currently have but in vr or is the main focus now that you know once we've ported things into a vr space let's explore what vr can do okay so uh it's a little bit of both it's mostly just we want to take what's possible for in-person collaboration and bring it into vr um, because we see a future of hybrid remote working and so covid obviously accelerated this dynamic um and so Rinji, our founder started the company in 2017 um, knowing, believing that hybrid remote work was going to become more and more possible as the internet and all things web 2.0 became more prevalent. And we have technology tools where you don't have to drive into an office every single day to accomplish work and be productive. But we found that the major challenges were people aren't as connected. The collaboration experience isn't the same as being in person. And so those are huge challenges for companies and a sense of decrease in productivity. So all these are major challenges to solve. And those are the challenges that Rinji set out to go build and fix with Immerse. And so when we think about uh, the future, we see Immerse as the best like tech bridge or tool for hybrid or remote working, where you can maximize that sense of connection that you have in person by having customizable avatars, where the fidelity and quality will increase over time. 
while I'm like giving you the tech tools through multiple monitors and like solo work, enhancing the solo work experience. So people become more productive, which the end goal of giving them more time back in the day. And then also corporations can continue to, to progress as well in their business goals while balancing that with giving employees more time back in their day and find that beautiful balance. And so uh, we, we see it as a, as, a, as a tech bridge, but we, as a VR company, we're also all exploring the potentials of VR. Like, is there something that we haven't tapped into yet that could be extremely valuable for all of our customers and users to add more value to their life and make their life better? Um, so there's there's a lot of it's it's not it's less so that it's more so we are gonna we want to virtualize to make the the hybrid remote collaboration work experience much more full better value with more value than it currently exists today with the Zoom Slack Microsoft Teams paradigm. Gotcha, great, thank you, Randall. Yeah, I, I'm curious. So it sounds like primarily or entirely what you've built is the the connective tissue between the sort of traditional 2D apps that people are using within their within their computer space and, and being able to create um, multi panels that people are interacting with that content on. Is that primarily through sort of traditional input mouse, keyboard, trackpad, or is this something where they're, they're interacting with those 2D apps through some of the more spatial modalities that are offered, hands or, or controllers? Do you use hands or is it all entirely controller based? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, great question. So the answer is we have Oculus for the, our largest user base is on the Oculus Quest 2. It's definitely the strongest headset bang for your buck uh, on the market for now. Uh, that's, there's no question. Um, but right now uh, you can control your VR dynamics with the controllers or with hand tracking. Uh, we actually suggest people use hand tracking because it's easier once you get used to it. Uh, one of the challenges we face right now is there is an inherent learning curve for people learning how to like interact with VR paradigms. Um, and as me being on our revenue side, I have to demonstrate immerse to a lot of different companies and organizations. And so it can be challenging at some points. Uh, I, I imagine it's, it would be very similar. I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't born, I was born in 95. And so I wasn't around these times, but I imagine it's, uh, it feels like demoing email to someone for the first time, like on a computer and they've never seen a computer where they totally understand the concept of email, no more paper memos, you don't have to do post-it notes, like paper organization and file cabinets, all exist in the computer and they get it. But if I, when I put a computer in front of them for the first time, they don't know how to use it. Like what's this trackpad, the keyboard, the mouse, they don't understand the UI, UX of the Aqua. Well, if the OS system, they, like they don't understand how to use that, so it's intimidating. So that's a challenge we we uh, we, we come across. Um, and then that that did answer your point uh, of your first question, Brindle. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've I've, I've got some follow-ups, okay. but I'll I'll cede the floor to Fred. Okay, um, okay, I'm kind of on that point. So I have been using uh, Immersed uh, for a bit, and. Um, the, the negatives to take that first is that uh, I think the onboarding really needs help. It's nice, you know, when you get that person standing to your side and pointing out things. But then, so the way it works is the hand tracking is really good. That is what I use. I use my normal keyboard, physical keyboard on my Mac, and then I have the monitor. But it's, to me, a little too easy to go in and out of the mode where my hands change the position and size of the monitor. Right. You're, you're supposed to do a special hand thing to kind of lock your hands to only to not be doing that. And so there's pinning. So when you're talking about these kind of onboarding issues, that's still a lot of work. And that's not a complaint for your company. That's a complaint across the board. Um, yes. The, the surprise is also it really is very pleasant. I mean, here in this group, we talk about, you know, many kind of interactions. But what I would like, in addition to making it more locked to make the pinning easier, I do find that sometimes that it doesn't want to go exactly where I want. I'm a very visual person, kind of anal in that way, to use that language. I want it straight ahead of me, but very often it's a little off. So if I resize it this way, then it kind of follows. So in other words, I'm so glad that you are working on these actual realities, boots on the ground thing, rather than just hypotheticals, because it shows mm -hmm. how difficult it is. Yes, it is. It's almost like it, a, you know, on you know, you get this little control thing on your wrist. If there was one that says hyper control mode, you know, different levels. Anyway, just observation and um, question and point. Yeah, so I can assure you that we uh, obsess over these things internally. Our developers are extremely passionate about what we're building. We have a very strong um, XR team, uh, and, our, and our founder is um, very proud about 
how hard it is to get into our company and how many people we reject. Uh, so we are really are hiring the best talent in the world. And I've seen this firsthand and getting to work with them. And we also have a very strong UI UX team. Um, and, but we're really on the frontier of this has never been done before. And we are pioneering what does it mean to have excellent UI UX paradigms and user onboarding paradigms in the virtual reality. And one of the challenges we face is that it, it's, it's still early. And so people are still trying to figure out even foundations for what is good UI UX. And we're now introducing space like spatial computing and like we're going from 2D interfaces to 3D and like what, what laws have we learned from good UI UX from 2D translate to 3D and paradigms of this. And people are now not just using a controller and a mouse, they're using hand tracking and like spatial awareness. And how do we, how do we build a good, not only do we understand what's a good practice for having good paradigms in UI UX, how do we code that well? And how do we build a good product around that while also having dependencies on Oculus and HTC and Apple, where we're dependent upon hardware technology to support our software. So we, we still live very much in the early days where there's a lot of tension of things are still being figured out and, and which is why we're in frontier tech um, and which is why it takes time to build. But even with VR, AR, I think it's just gonna take longer because there's so many more factors to consider that are the people who pioneered 2D technology, you know, Apple, Microsoft, et cetera they didn't have to consider. And so I think the problem we're solving candidly is exponentially harder than the problem they had to solve. But we also get to stand on their shoulders and take some precedence that they built for us and apply that to VR where it makes sense. Um, so in terms of the, those new modalities, in terms of the sort of the interaction paradigms that seem to make the most sense, um, it sounds like, so you're not building software that people use as much as you're using making software that people reach through to their other software with at this point is that correct you're not making a word processor you're making the app that lets people sort of see that word processor which is you know it, it's a big it's a big problem i don't i'm not minimizing it oh my yeah, question but... is do you have uh observations based on what people are doing the way that they're changing for example the size of their windows the, the kinds of ways that they're they're interacting with it do you have either observations about what customers are doing as a result of sort of making the transition into effective productivity there? Or do you have any specific recommendations about things that they should avoid or, or reconsider given the differences in, for example, pixel density or the angular fidelity of hand tracking within 3D in comparison to the fidelity of being able to move around a physical mouse and keyboard, given that those things are so much more precise, so much more precise, but also much more limited in terms of the real estate that they have the ability to cover. Do you have any observations about what people do or even better, any recommendations that you make to clients about what they should be doing as a result of moving into the new medium? Yeah, really good question. Um... There's a few things. There's a lot of things we could suggest. And so a lot of what we're building is still very exploratory of what's the best paradigm for these things. And so we've learned a lot of things, but we also understand there's a lot more for us to build internally and explore. Uh, for first, first and foremost, we definitely do not take, uh, hopefully this is obvious, but to address, we definitely do not take a dystopian view of VR and AR. We don't want people living in the headset. We don't want people just like strapped to their face, you know, extremities of like a feeding tube and water, et cetera. That's not the future we want. Uh, we actually see VR and AR as a productivity enhancer. So people can spend less time working because they're getting more done in our products because we've created a product so good that allows them to be more productive. So they get more done at work, but also have more time to themselves. And so we suggest people take breaks. Like we don't want you in a headset like for eight hours straight, the same way like no person would suggest for you to sit in front of your computer and like not stand or use the restroom or eat lunch or go on a walk or take a break. We had to take the same paradigms um, because immersed, uh, because you can get so focused and immersed, um, but that is something we also want to encourage our users of like, yeah, get stuff done, but take a break. Um, but then we're also thinking through some, some of the observations we found are we, we've been surprised at uh, how focused people have been. And then once the, the onboarding challenge is a big challenge that as Frode was mentioning is one that we think about often of how do we make the onboarding experience better? And we've made progressions um, from based, based on where we came from in the past. And so Frode, you're seeing some of our first iterations of our onboarding experience from the past, we didn't have one. That's something I actually pushed really, really hard for. But we saw a lot of uh, challenges of users sticking around because we didn't have one. And we're now continuing to push of how do we make this easier um, explain things to people without making it too long where people will get disinterested and leave. It's a really hard problem to solve. 
Um, but we're found as we have an easier onboarding experience and helping people get used to the paradigms of working in VR and AR and explaining how our technology works and letting them get to what we like to call this magic moment of where they can see the potential of seeing having their screens in VR, having it be like fully manipulative where you're like the Jedi in the forest. You can push and pull your screens with hand tracking, you can pinch and expand, put them all around you. Um, so we're, we're still, uh, if, I'm, if I'm answering your question, Randall, we're still exploring a lot of paradigms, but we found that it's surprising that how focused people are getting, uh, which is awesome and encouraging, uh, we find, uh, which isn't surprising as much anymore, companies and organizations and teams are always very wowed at how connected they feel to each other. And so we always try to encourage people working together. So even on our elite tier, which is just our middle tier, like a pro, think of it as a pro solo user, you have the ability to meet and collaborate with up to four people in a private room. But we also have uh, public spaces uh, where people can hang out and it's free to use. Just think of it as like a, like a virtual coffee shop. You can hang out there and meet with people. Uh, you can't share your screens, obviously, for security reasons, uh, but you can meet new people and collaborate. And it's, it's been cool to see how we've formed our own community where people can be connected with each other uh, to be able to hang out and meet new people. And so hopefully that answers a little bit of your questions. And there's, there's still a lot more we're learning about the paradigms of working in 2D screens and what people prefer and what's good best practice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm curious, one of the, one of the issues that uh, I, I face when I think about where people can expect to be in VR productivity at this point is mm -hmm. the fact that Quest 1, Quest 2, Vive, all of these things have a focal distance, which is pretty pretty distant it's it's normally minimum sort of accommodation distance is about 1.4 meters um which means that anything that's at approximately arm's length which is where we have done the entirety of our productivity in the past mm -hmm. um is actually getting to, to within eye strain sort of territory the only mm -hmm. headset that is out on the market that has any capacity for addressing that kind of range is actually the magic leap um which i don't you know recommend anybody pursue um, because it's got a it's got a second focal plane at 35 centimeters. Have you um, do you know do you know um, where people put those 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 panels on Quest uh, on Vive? Uh, I don't know if you've got folks in in a, in a crystal or a or a Vario, uh, whether that that has any sort of uh, distinction in terms of where they put them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm super curious as to, or, or, or alternatively, like, um, do you recommend, or are you aware of anybody making any modifications for, for being able to deal with a, a closer focal distance? Um, mm -hmm. Just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in whether, whether people can actually work the way they, they want to as a consequence of the current limitations of the hardware out on the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are a few things in response to that. One, we, we've actually found internally, even with the Quest 2, although the, the screen distance, et cetera, focal point is, is a challenge. We've actually found that people in our experience are reporting less eye strain working in VR than they are working from their computer. We're candidly still trying to figure out why that's the case. Uh, I'm not sure how like the dis like how the distance and like the, the the optics games that they're playing in the Quest 2 and other headsets we use, uh, but we've actually found that people are reporting less eye strain just solely on customer reviews and feedback. So we haven't done any studies. Um, I personally don't know a lot around IPDs and focal length distance of the exact hardware technology of all the headsets on the market. All I'm doing is paying attention to our customers and what they're saying and our users. And we're actually surprisingly not getting that much eye strain. And we've actually said that a lot of people say they prefer working in VR in front of their computers without even blue light glasses and they're still getting less eye strain. So the, the science and technicalities of how that's working, I'm not sure. It's definitely uh, out of my, my realm of expertise. Um, but I can assure you that the hardware manufacturers, because of our close relationship with Meta, HTC, they're constantly thinking about that problem too, because you're strapping an HMD to your face. Like, how does that, like, how do you have a good experience from a health standpoint for your eyes? Yeah. Do you know how much time people are clocking in it um, in yeah, terms of so I, broad strokes? So on average, our first user session is right around an hour, 45 minutes to two hours. And we have users, we are power users. This isn't all of them. We have power users who are spending six to eight hours a day inside of Immerse and clocking that much time in and generating and getting value out of it. And it's consistent. And uh, I say, uh -huh. uh, I'm not sure what our average session time is. Uh, I'd say it's probably around an hour, two hours, but we have people who use it for focus first where they want to go to focus sessions in Immerse or people will spend four or five hours in it and our power users will spend six, seven, eight hours. So I can address that, um, these few points, because first of all, it's kind of nice. Um, I don't go in Immersed every week, but when I do, I do get an email that says how many minutes I spent in Immersed, which mm -hmm. is, is quite a useful statistic. So I'm sure, obviously, you guys have more on that. 
when it comes to the, the eye strain, I put the, I tend to make the monitor quite large and put it away to do exactly the accommodation yes. you're talking about, Randall. And I used to not like physical monitors being at that distance. It was a bit odd. But since right. I am keyboard trackpad, where I don't have to search for a mouse, it's I don't need to see my hands anyway, even though I can. Um, I, I do think that works. But maybe, Gavin, would you want to do it? You said you had a video to mm -hmm. maybe share a little bit of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I can pull that up real quickly. Uh, so it's a quick like marketing demo video, but it does do a good job of showcasing uh, the potential of what's possible. And I'm not sure if you guys will be able to hear the audio. It's it's just a fun background music. It's not that important. The visuals are what's more important. Um, but let me go ahead and pull this up for us real quick. I think you can just use the audio then and talk if you want to highlight something, I guess. Okay. Actually, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Okay. Let me share my screen here. Yeah. Okay. Can everyone see? Yeah. Perfect. So let me go ahead and pull this up. Yeah. So this is also just on YouTube. So just for each of uh, your points, if you guys are curious and want to see more content, you just type in Immerse VR on YouTube. It's our uh, Immerse logo pretty clear. Our content team and marketing team put out a lot of content. So if you're curious, we also have a video that's called Working VR, like 11 tips for productivity, where head of content goes through uh, some different pro tips. So if you're curious and just want to dive in more of like I think a more like nuanced demo of how you do things, et cetera, to see more of the user experience. So but this is a good, helpful, high level video. So you can see you can have full control of your monitor. You can make it ginormous like a movie screen. We have video editors, day traders, finance teams, and mostly developers are our main uh, customer base. As you can see here, the user just sitting down at the coffee table. The keyboard is tracked. We also have a brand new keyboard feature coming out where it's called keyboard pass through, where we'll leverage the cameras of your Oculus Quest 2 to cut a hole into VR to see your real life keyboard, which we're very excited about. And here you can just see just a, a brief collaboration session of um, two users uh, collaborating with each other side by side. You can also incorporate your phone into VR uh, if you want to have your phone there. And then here you'll see what it looks like to have a, a meeting in one of our conference rooms. So you can have multiple people in the room. We've easily had 30 plus people in an environment, so we can easily support that. Um, it also depends on obviously everyone's network strength and quality, uh, very similar to you know Zoom or a phone call. And that's just shows how, how quality the meeting it is from their, their audio and, and screen sharing input. But if everyone's on a good network quality, that's not an issue. And then lastly here, you can see it's one of our users with five screens working in a space station. And that's about it. Any questions or things that stood out from that specifically? Yeah, question about the backgrounds. Um, you have some nice environments that can be applied. It, it, um, of, we, I think we can also import any 360 images, that right, currently? And if so, can we also uh, load custom 3D environments in the future? Um, is that Are you thinking about customization for that aspect of it? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we are thinking about it, and we do have plans for users to incorporate 3D environments. There are a few challenges with that for a few obvious reasons, which I can talk, touch on in a second. But we do support 360 environments, or 360 photos for users to incorporate. Um, and we also have a very talented artist and content or artist and um, developer team that are constantly making new environments. And we have user polls and we figure out what our users want to build and what they'd like to see. And then as we obviously continue to grow our company, uh, so right now we're in the process of fundraising for a Series A. And uh, once we do that, we're hoping to go from 27, 28 employees right now to at least 100 by the end of the year. The vast majority of them will be developers to continue to enhance the quality of our product. Um, and then we also will support uh, 3D imports of environments. Um, but because the Quest 2 has some compute liability or compute uh, limitations, rather, uh, we have to make sure that each of our environments have specific poly counts and specific compute measurements so that the, the Quest 2 won't explode if they try to open that environment and immerse, as well as making sure that your immersed experience is going to be optimized and high quality, not going to lag, et cetera. And so right now we're, we're thinking through how do we enable our users to build custom environments? Um, and then two, how do we make sure they meet our specific requirements for the Quest 2? But naturally over time, headsets are going to get stronger, computer powers can get better. Very similarly, when you go from, you know, a Nintendo 64 graphics to now the Xbox Series X, a ginormous leap of quality, headset quality will be the same. So we'll be able to have more robust environments and have some more give and take of um, optimizations for environments our users give to us. So it is in our pipeline, but we're pushing it further than we, uh, than we, uh, than we 
pushing it further down the pipeline than we originally wanted, just due to some natural tech limitations. Right. Sure. And also, in fact, we are a venture-backed startup and we have to be extremely careful of what we work on and optimize for the highest impact. Um, but uh, we're starting to have some more fun and having some traction in our Series A conversations and hopefully have some more flexibility financially to, to continue pushing. Uh, thank you. Uh, Alan? Uh, yeah, so this is a, maybe a kind of a, a Twilio-esque question uh, about the, the design material of, of network strength, of bandwidth, and compute, like mm -hmm. you mentioned. And I'm wondering, uh, I saw in the demo, the virtual keyboard, um, that, that of course would, the inputs would be connected to uh, network. Um, versus a physical keyboard that you already have in front of you, if it were possible to use the physical keyboard and have those inputs go into the VR uh, environment or AR environment in this case, uh, would that be preferred? Is that the plan? Um, and if so, you know, that opens up, I mean, this, this is such a rich pioneer, as you mentioned, territory, you know, so many ways to handle this. Would there be a future where uh, if my hands are doing one thing, then that's an indication that I'm in my real world environment. But if my hand does something else and that's suggesting, you know, take my hand into VR so I can manipulate something. Uh, I'm curious about any thoughts about, about that, essentially that design problem versus the, the hard physical constraints of bandwidth. Is it just easier? Does it make a better experience to stick with a virtual keyboard? For that reason, so you, you don't at least have a disconnect between real world and VR, uh, and I'm sure there are other ways to frame that question. No, that's fine, and I, I, I can answer a few points and then a few follow questions to make sure I understand you correctly. For the keyboard specifically, the current keyboard tracking system we have in place is not optimal. It was just uh, us, the first step of us, what we wanted to build to help make the typing and VR problem easier, which is our biggest uh, request. So we are now leveraging, I think, a, a way, way, way stronger feature, which is called keyboard pass-through. So for those of you who know, the Oculus Quest 2 has a pass-through feature where you can see the real world around you through their camera system and they're stitching the imagery together. We now have the ability to create like a pass-through portal system. So where we can cut out a hole in VR over your keyboard. So whatever keyboard you have, whether it's Mac, Apple, whatever, the funky keyboards that we have a lot of our developers really like to use for a few reasons, you can now see that keyboard in your real hands through a little cutout in VR. Uh, and then when it comes from inputs of what you mentioned of like doing something with your hand, of like it being a real life thing versus VR thing, are you referring to that in regards to having a mixed reality headset to where it can do AR and VR and like you want to be able to switch from real world to VR with a hand motion? Is that what yeah, you're referring to? Yeah, the question. That, that, uh, I can clarify. Uh, I am referring to, to uh, mixed, but... Uh, okay. But specifically where that applies is uh, the, the cutout window approach right. is definitely a step in the right direction, but it seems like that's still based entirely on the Oculus's understanding of what your fingertips are doing, which will obviously have some misfires. And that would be an incredibly frustrating experience for someone who's used to a keyboard always, you know, responding, hitting the keys that you're supposed to be hitting. So at some right. point it might make more sense to say, okay, actually, we're going to cut out, we're going to forget the, the, the window approach and have the real mm -hmm. input from the real keyboard go into our system, which means that uh, in that sense, it would be saying- uh, so That's what it is, off. Alan. What's that? Yeah, so, so, so further clarified, you would, we always want our users to use their real hands on the real keyboard. And like, it's, this isn't like, you're not using your virtual hands on a virtual keyboard. You're now seeing with pass through your real hands on your real right. keyboard and right. you're typing on your real keyboard. A really important point to make uh, in this discussion is there's, if for a single user, there's two two elements here. There is the thing around you, image or 3D, and then you have your screen. But that is the normal Mac, Linux, or Windows screen, and you use your normal keyboard. So I have actually used my own software. I've used Author to do some writing, you know, on a big, mm -hmm. nice screen. So it is exactly the keyboard I'm used to. Uh, All right. So how that applies to the mixed reality question is right. uh, if, if I'm using the real keyboard, have the real screen, but one of my screens is sort of like an iPad, a touch screen that's right. in VR, where I want right. to move some elements around, how do I then transition from my hands in the real world to now I want my hand to be in VR? Mm -hmm. So you're going to be 
and immerse as of now. You're going to be in VR and you're going to have a small cutout into the real world. And so it's it's just just right here is is uh, real world like through a cutout hole. And then if you have your hands here and you want to move your hands into here, the moment it, your hands leave the pass through portal in VR, like oh, yeah. it, it turns it turns into virtual hands. That's and so right. it's just a little. Yeah. And so, and to further clarify right now, like your virtual hands you have in hand tracking will still be over your hands on the pass through window. We're experimenting, taking that out for further clarity of seeing your camera hands like on your keyboard. Um, but yes, like when you're in immersed, it's like, it, it will transition from your camera hands, real life hands to like virtual hands. So if you have an iPad, you want to like swipe something, whatever it's that's seamless. Um, but then for mixed reality dynamics in the future, we're not sure how what that's going to look like because um, it's not here yet. So we need we need yeah, time right, to experiment right. and figure that's out awesome. what that looks like. Uh, Fabian, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's actually a continuation of your question uh, because you ask about the background environment and using three hundred and sixty and including the old model. It's also a question that you know I was going to ask, and I guess uh, given is because I'm a developer, you can imagine it too. Uh, is if it's not enough. Uh, if somehow there are features that I want to develop and they are very weird, nobody else will care about it. And as you said, as a startup, you can't do everything. You need to put some priorities. Uh, what can I do, basically? Is it open source? If not, is there an API? If there is an API, what has the community built so far? Yeah, great question. So as of now, we currently don't have any APIs or open SDKs, open source code for users to use. Uh, we've had this feature request a lot and our, our CEO is pondering what his approach wants to be in the future. So we do want to do something around that in the future, but because we're still so early stage and we have so many things we have to focus on, it's extremely important that we're very careful with what we work on and how focused and how hardworking we are towards those. Um, as we continue to progress as a company and as our revenue increases, and as we raise subsequent, round, subsequent rounds of funding, that gives us the flexibility to explore these things. And one of the, one of the biggest feature requests we've had is having an immersed SDK for our streaming monitor technology so people can start to play with different variations of what we're building. Um, but I do know that Ringy does not allow for any free open source coding work whatsoever. Uh, just for a few reasons, legality wise, and I think we had a few experiences in the past where we experimented with that and it backfired to where developers were claiming they were they owed, they deserved equity or funding. It was a hot mess. Um, and so we don't allow anyone to work for us for free or to give us any form of software to any regard, any work period to, to prevent any legal issues, um, to prevent any claims like that, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, but he, he's, a, he's a stickler and definitely will not budge on that. Um, but in the future, hopefully we'll have an SDK or some APIs that are opened up for open source code once we're more successful and established for people to experiment and start making their own fun iterations immersed on. Um, I have a question about the windows. So you mentioned that it, when somebody has a pro subscription, they can be uh, socially connected but not share screens. I presume in an enterprise circumstance, people can see each other's windows. Have you observed any ways in which people have used their windows uh, more discursively in terms of having them as props essentially for communicating with each other rather than primarily or solely for, for working on their own? Like the fact that they can move these monitors, these windows around, does that change anything about the, the function of them within a workflow or a discussion content? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, to clarify on the tier and your functionality, so we have a free tier where you have you can connect your computer into Burst and you have one free uh, virtual display. Uh, you cannot on a free tier ever share screens uh, in, in all of our public rooms. You can't share screens regardless of your licensed tier. The only place you can share screens is in a private collaboration room, which means you have to be in our elite tier or a team's tier. On our elite uh -huh. tier, which is our mid pro solo tier, is you can have up to three other people in the room with you, four total, and you can share screens with each other. And the default is your screens are never shared. So if you have four people in a room and they each have three screens up, you cannot see anyone else's screen until you voluntarily share your screen and confirm that screen. And then it'll highlight red for security purposes. But if you're in an environment where, Brindle, you wanted to share your screen, when you share your screen and say we're all sitting at a conference room table, if I have my screens like one, two, three right here and I share my middle screen, my screen is then going to pop up in your perspective to you, to where yes. you have control of my shared screen. You can make it larger, make it bigger, shrink it, et cetera. And we're also mm -hmm. going to be building different environment anchors to where, uh, say, for example, in your conference room and in a normal conference room, you have a large TV on the wall. 
say in virtual reality, you could take your screen and like snap it to that, that place. And once it's snapped into that little TV slot, that screen will be automatically shared and everyone sees it at that perspective rather than their own perspective. And so, and then from a communication standpoint, we have teams who will meet together in the different dedicated rooms uh, and then they'll share screens and look at data together. There's, um, I can't remember quite the name, uh, it's it's like a software development team where something goes down, like uh, like they have to very DevOps. early come together. Yeah, DevOps teams come together. They share screens looking at data to fix like a down server or something. And they can all see and analyze that data together. And then we're exploring the, the different feature ads we can add to make that experience easier and more robust. Uh, and so, yeah, my, my question is, do you, do, are you aware of the ways in which people make use of that in terms of um, being able to share and show things, share and show more things. One of the one of the things about desktop computing, even in a context where people are uh, co-located, co-present in in physical meet space, um, you don't actually have very good performability of computer monitors. You know, it kind of sucks in Zoom. It kind of sucks in uh, in real life as well. Um, do people show and share differently as a consequence of being in the verse? Can you characterize anything about that? Yes. And so the answer is yes. They have the ability to share more screens. And so in meet space in the real world, a funny term there for meet space, uh, you can uh, only have one computer screen if you're working on a laptop. And that's frustrating unless you have like a TV, you have to airdrop, XYZ, whatever. But in immerse, you can have up to five screens. And so we have teams who will, teams of four, and they'll share two or three screens at once. And they can have a whole arrangement of data of like, 10 screens that are being shared and they can rearrange those individually. So it all pops up in front of them and then they all rearrange them in an order that they want and they can all watch like a, like a huge sharing screen of data uh, that is not possible in real life because of the technology we provide to them. And then there's different iterations of that experience where maybe it's two or three screens, it's here, it's there. Um, and so because of the core tech that we have where you can have multiple screens and then share each of those that opens up the possibility for more data visualization because you have more screen real estate this opportunity to collaborate more effectively than if you had one computer screen you know on zoom which as you mentioned is challenging or even in real life because you just don't have the you know, like in real life you could have a computer and like two tvs but in immersed you could have eight screens being shared at once And do you share control? Uh, is it something where it's only the, sh the person sharing it has the control so other people would have read-only access or do you have the ability for people to be able to pass that control around them? Send the user events such that, that everybody would be able to have shared control. Mm -hmm. So not right now, but we're building that out. Uh, for the time being, we want everyone just to use collaboration tools they're currently using. So use Google Docs, mm -hmm. use Miro, use uh, Slack, whatever. So the current like collaboration documents you guys are using now, we just want to just use those applications on Immersed because whatever, whatever you can run on your computer, you can run on your screen in Immersed. It's, it is just your computer in Immersed. Um, so we tell people to do that. But now they get the added benefit of deeper connection to actually sitting next to your employee or your, your colleague. And then now you can have multiple screens being shared. And so now it's like a supercharged charged productivity experience, collaboration experience. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, I, have, I have four minutes left, so I want to make sure I can answer all the questions you guys have. I'll make a one minute question. Uh, I'll just say faster. If, if I understood correctly, the primitive is the screen, but is there anything else beyond the screen? Like, can you share 3D assets? Uh, would the content you pull from the screen? If not, can you take capture of the screen, either as image or video? And is it the whole screen only or part of the screen? And imagining you've done that, let's say part of the screen as a video of 30 seconds, can you make it permanent in the environment so that if I come back with colleagues tomorrow, uh, uh, capture, because that's a challenge we have here all the time. It's like we have great discussions and then what happens to the content? Um, so yeah. Yeah, so it's in our pipeline to incorporate other assets that will be able to be brought into Immersed and then remain persistent in the rooms. And so we've created the technology for persistent rooms, meaning uh, like, it's, it, like whatever you leave in there, it's gonna stay very similar to like a conference room that you've dedicated for projects, you put post notes around the wall, it obviously you'd come back the next day, it's still there. Same concept, but now in VR. And then we also have plans to incorporate 3D assets, 3D CAD models, et cetera, into Immerse. Um, but because you have your screens and teams are teams have figured out how to like collaborate on 2D screens, uh, we're just like, we, for the time being, we're saying just continue to use your CAD model software on your computer 2D. But in the future, we'll have that capability. 
but we also don't want to be like a three modeling VR software. And so we're trying to find that balance, which is why it's been deprioritized, uh, but it is coming and hopefully in 2022. Um, and then uh, we have also ex like explored having video like files that inform of screens or like an image file or post-it notes or like a, we also are going to improve our whiteboard experience, which is just some of one of our first iterations. And so there's a lot of improvements we're going to be making uh, in the future in additions to different assets, photos, videos, 3D modeling software, et cetera. Um, we've, we've had that request multiple times and we plan on building it in the future. Oh, this is super quick. It means uh, you get in, you do the work, you get out, but you don't have something like a, a trace of it as is right now. As in persistence, as in you get in, you like leave your screens there. Can you, can you or even something you can extract out of it. Hodge was saying that, for example, he gets an email about the time he spent on a session, but is there something else? Again, because usually you have maybe not a Eureka moment, but you have some kind of realization in the space, thanks to the space and the tools. Uh, and how can you get it out? It's usually a struggle. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'm not sure I'm understanding your question correctly, but well, you... so, so in this. Uh, maybe I can take a, yeah. take a run at it. So uh, when people play VR games at a VR right. arcade, one of the things that people will often produce is kind of a sizzle reel of moments in that that action. There's a replay. Oh, recording the VR experience. Yeah, experience. An, an art, artifact of the experience of, of, of right. that process. Okay. Okay, yes. And so you, for the time being, there is no functionality in Immerse for that, but Oculus gives you the ability to record what you're watching in VR, and you can pull that out and like take that experience with you, uh, and as well as take snapshots. Um, and then we, we, we have no plans on incorporating that functionality into Immerse just because Oculus has it, and I think HTC does, and other hardware manufacturers will provide that like recording experience for you to then take away with you. Thank you very much, Gavin. Mm -hmm. A very interesting real-world perspective on a very specific issue. So very, very grateful. Uh, we'll stay in touch. Uh, run to your next meeting. Um, when this journal issue is out, um, I will I'll send you an update. Thank you, Frode. It was a pleasure getting to chat with each of you. Uh, God bless. Hope you guys have a great Friday and weekend and we'll stay connected. You too. Take care. Uh, Bye. Thanks, y'all. Did we just lose... Alan, we lost Alan. Don't Maybe he actually had to go. Did he say he had to go? I'm not sure. Um, I am gonna drop at some point as well. I uh, the my my Fridays uh, I'm missing the the near future laboratory uh, chats uh, from uh, joining the second hour of this, and so I, I want to make sure that I keep my hand in that community as well because they're very interesting people too. Oh, okay. Um, that sounds interesting. Uh, yeah, we should try to, we, yeah, we can look at changing times and stuff, but um, right. So briefly on this and then on the meeting that I had with Elliot earlier today. Yeah. Um, this is interesting to us because they are thinking a lot less VR than we are, but it is a real and commercial company. And you know, obviously a lot of his words were very, very salesy, which is fine. Um, but it literally is rectangle in the room. Yeah, that's it. So in many ways, it's really phenomenally useful. And I'm very glad they're doing it. I'm glad we have a bit of a connection to them now. But the whole issue of taking something out of the screen and putting it somewhere else, it was partly using their system that made me realize that's not possible. And that's actually kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. So that's that. And the meeting that Elliot and I had today, uh, he mentioned who it was with. Um, and I, I didn't want to put too much into the record on that. But it was really, really interesting. The meeting was because of Visual Meta. Elliot introduced us to these people um, because of, yeah, and Vint. Vint couldn't be there today. We started a discussion. They have all kinds of issues with Visual Meta. They love the idea, but then their implementation issues, blah, blah, blah. But towards the end, when I started talking about um, the Metaverse thing, they had no idea about the problems that we have learned. And they were really invigorated and stressed by it. So I think what we're doing here in this community is right on. I'm going to try now to rewrite some of the earlier stuff to say, to, to write a little piece over the weekend on academic documents in the metaverse to highlight the issues. And if you guys want to contribute some issues to that document, that would be great or not, depending on, on how you feel. But um, I think they really understood that. What I said to them at, at the end is, 
if you have a physical meeting, you have a piece of paper, you can do whatever you want. But in the metaverse, it can only do with the document, whatever the room allows you to, which is mind-blowingly crazy. And they, they represent a lot of um, really big publishers within medicine. You know, they are under the National Institute of Health, as I understand. I'm not sure if Elliot is still in the room. So yeah, it, it, it was good that we are looking in the right areas. Yeah, that's really constructive. Um, for my part, one of the things that I've realized is um, that the the hypertext people, the the people who are under, understand the, the the value of things like structured writing and relationship linking and things like that, are far better positioned than ma many, possibly most, to understand some of the questions and issues that are intrinsic to the idea of a metaverse. Uh, I was watching, so I linked a, a podcast to some folks. Um, it's called, I think, is it called Into the Metaverse? But it's, um, it's, it was there was a conversation between a VP of Unreal and the uh, and the principal programmer, whatever architect of of Unity. So Vladimir Vukucevic, who was the who created uh, no, uh, so the, not not um, Meta, but um, uh, Unreal and Unity. And uh, uh, Vukucevic, uh, I don't know if I'm garbling that name, um, is uh, he was the he was the inventor of WebGL, and uh, which is the the foundation for all of the stuff that we do in virtual reality on, on in web, uh, as well as just being very good for being able to do fancy graphics as I do at work and things like that. Uh, but their view of what goes into a metaverse what needs to be known about entities relationships descriptions and things was just incredibly naive um it's uh, and uh, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll link the videos uh, and but they, and they see the idea of, of of a browser as being sort of intrinsic and another first person the who's a 25 year veteran of um of pixar and the inventor of the universal scene description format usd which as as you may know um Apple is interested in sort of promoting as as being useful, um, in the form of what what this sort of platform, format of choice for uh, augmented reality quick look files things like that. Um, and uh, and again, just incredible naivete in terms of what are important things to be able to describe with regard to relationships and constraints and 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 linkages uh, of of the kind that that hypertext. Uh, it's the it's the bread and butter of understanding how to make a hypertext relevant, sort of notionally and structurally in a way that means that it's navigable. So, yeah, it's it's exciting, but it's also distressing to see how 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 much that thinking of people who are really tit titans of of an interactive graphics kind of field, um, yeah, that's correct. Uh, uh, don't don't know what this medium is. <laughs> so that was fun. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's scary and fun, but I think we're very lucky to have Bob here because, yeah, I've been very about the document and so on, and for Bob to say, well, actually, let's use the wall as well, um, it, it, it helps us think about going between spaces, and what I highlighted in the meeting earlier today was, you know, what if I take one document from one repository, and let's say it has all the meta, so I put a little bit here, a little bit there, but then I have another document from a different repository over here. And I draw a connection between them. That connection now is a piece of information too. Where is that stored? Who owns it? And how do I interact with that in the future? These are things that are not even begun to be addressed because I think all the companies doing the big stuff just want everything to go through their stuff. And what kind is it that is the connection? Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. So we're early naive days. So we, we need to produce some interesting worthwhile questions here. Fabian, I see your big yellow hand. <laughs> I'll put the less yellow hand on the side. Um, so I know, I, but when earlier when I said, I don't know what I'm doing, I was not like, it wasn't like fake modesty or trying to uh, undermined uh, my work or this kind of thing is like, I actually mean it. Uh, I, I do a bunch of stuff and some of the stuff I do, I hope is interesting. I hope is even new uh, and might lead to other things. But in, in practice, it's not purely random and there are some 
let's say, uh, not heuristic, but there were some design principle, philosophy behind it, understanding of some uh, hopefully core principle, let's say, of neurology or cognitive science or, or just engineering. But in practice, I, I think we have to be humble enough about this being a new medium. And figuring it out is not uh, trivial, it's not easy, and it's not, I think, it is part of it is intelligence and, and knowledge, uh, but a lot of it is all that plus luck plus attempting. Oh, I, I agree with you. And I see that in this group. The reason I said it was I just wanted him to have a clue of the level of who we are in the room. That, that's all. Uh, I think our ignorance in this room is great. Uh, I, I saw this um, graphic when I started studying. I, I haven't been able to find the source, but it showed if you know this much about a subject, the circumference is the ignorance. It's small. The more you know, the bigger the circumference it is. And I found <laughs> that to be such a graphic illustration of you know something, you know you don't know, and it's not just a, a, a yeah, absolutely. We need to to go all over the place, but at least we're beginning to see some of the questions, and I think that's um, a, a real contribution of, of what we're doing here. So we just got to keep on on going. Um, so also, as you know, we now have two presenters a month, which means for the next two or three months, I've only signed up one. Uh, Brandel is going to be doing, hopefully, in two to three weeks, something, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm still chipping away at it. I realize that I there's some, there's some reading I need to do in order to make sure that I'm not mischaracterizing Descartes. Okay, that sounds like fun. Uh, Fabian, <laughs> would you honor us as well with doing a, a hosted presentation over the next a uh, month or two or something. Yeah, with pleasure. pleasure. Fantastic. Our pathetic little journal is growing slightly less pathetic by the month. I will, uh, I can give a teaser uh, on, um, I don't have a, a title yet, but let's say on um, uh, how a librarian, what a librarian would do if they were able to uh, move walls around. That's interesting. That's very interesting. It was good. The one we had on uh, Monday with Jad was completely different from what we're looking at. You know, going looking at identity, and for you to now talk about that aspect is like it's this it's kind of a spatial aspect. That's very interesting. I'm looking forward to whatever you write about uh, this weekend, uh, Road. Um, Thank you. Because the for for me. Uh, the summaries of, of our uh, discussions with some organization, not, nope, not anywhere near perfect organization, not asking for that, but, but some organizations, some patterns um, are what are important to me. And when I find really, uh, really good bunches of those, then I can visualize them. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm still looking for some sort of um, expression of levels of where the problems are in, as we see it now. In other words, there were, uh, the, what I heard today with Immersed was a set of problems at a certain level to some degree, and then a little bit in the organization of knowledge but not a lot, but that's what came up in our discussion afterwards and so forth. So uh, and whenever there's a, you know, th that kind of summary, I really appreciate you, what, you know, whatever you do in that regard, because I know it's, it's the hardest work uh, at this stage. So um, I'm, I'm trying to say something encouraging, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Bob, that, that's very nice. I just put a link on, um... This, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, the, the document that I wrote today on, uh, to, well, wrote it yesterday for the guys today. The next thing will be, you know, as we discussed, but, you know, information has to be somewhere. It's such an obvious thing, but it isn't, seem, it doesn't seem to be acknowledged because in a virtual environment, you know, we all know that you watch a Pixar animation, they've made every single pixel on the screen. You know, there, there is no sky even, we know that. But when it becomes interactive and we move things in and out, 
Oh, Brando had a thing there. Well, so uh, one of the one of one of the things that they that, that Guido Claroni talks about, uh, as as well as uh, 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 people have, have kind of uh, talked a bunch about uh, some of the influences and uh, contributions of another guy, Inigo Quiles, um, and he uh, they they uh, so Quiles uh, makes um, shader toy. I don't know if you've ever seen that or heard of that, but it's this uh, ray marched uh, based fragment shader system for being able to do procedural systems. Uh, and so one of the things, so, so um, none of the, uh, none of the moss in Brave, if you've seen that film, exists. Nobody modeled it. Nobody, uh, nobody uh, decided which pieces should go where. Uh, what, what they did was, uh, uh, Killers has this amazing mind for a, a, a completely novel form a representation of data. It's called the sine distance field Raymart shader. And, uh, and so it's all procedural. And all people had to do was navigate through this implicit virtual space to find the pieces that they wanted to stitch into the film. And, mm. uh, and so, so it, it never existed. It's something that was kind of conjured in a, in a, in a procedure, on a procedural basis, and then people navigated through it. So, so yes, it, it, things have to exist, but that's not because people make it sometimes. And sometimes oh, uh, it's because people make a latent space and then they navigate it. And I think that the, the contrast between those two things is, is fascinating in terms of what, what that means, uh, sort of creative tools oblige us to be able to kind of do. Anyway. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Like No Man's Sky and, and you know, lots of interesting software there, but it's it, it's still not in the world, so to speak. There is no background. Yes. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, yep. course, of course, we agree. So... Um, yeah, uh, but one thing I still really want, and I'm going to pressure you guys every time. No, it's not to write your bio, but it is some mechanism where, as an example, our journal, I can put it in a thing so that you guys can put it in your thing. Because then we can really start having real stuff that is our stuff. Um, so if you can keep that in the back of your mind, even if you can... Um, um, even if you can just spec how it should work, I'll try to find someone to do it if it's kind of rote work and not a big brain work for you guys. Yeah, I, I, I definitely intend to play more with uh, actually representing text again. Um, and somebody put, made a sort of a, a an invitation slash prompt slash challenge to, to get my text rendering to be better, which means that I'll need something to do it better on. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I think that would be a really interesting target and goal. Awesome. Uh, Fabian, I see you have your hand, but on, on, on that same request to you guys, imagine, you know, we already have some web pages where you can click at the bottom, view and VR, you know, when you're in the environment, that's nice. Imagine if we have documents like that, right? That'll be a maze. And I don't know what that would mean yet. There are some thoughts, but it kind of goes towards the earlier. Okay, yes, Fabian, please. Um, yeah, I think we need to go a bit beyond imagining then. We can we can have some sandbox, some prototypes of, uh, of the documents uh, we have. Actually, that's, that's how I started the first time I, I joined. Uh, you mentioned visual meta, and then I put a PDF and some of the meta data in there, no matter how ugly the outcome was. Uh, so I definitely think that's one of the most interesting ways to do it. Uh, the, the quick word on writing, my personal fear about writing uh, is that, I, I don't know if you know the concept, uh, and I have the name of the tip on my, of my tongue, but uh, yeah, ID depth. It's like Sorry? if I write ID depth. Uh, so the, the idea is that you have too many ideas and that at some point, if you don't realize some of them, if you don't build, implement, make it happen, however the form is, it's just crushing. Uh, and, and then I, let's say if I start to, to write or prepare for the presentation I, I mentioned just uh, 30 minutes or 10 minutes ago, the, the, the excitement and the problem is it's for sure by summarizing it, stepping back is going to bring new ideas. I'm like, oh, now I need to implement. Now I need to test if it's uh, there is validation or it. So it just I'm just not complaining or anything. Just showing a bit my perspective of my fear of writing, and also because in the past at some point I did just write. I did not code anything. 
uh, and it felt good in a way, but then also a lot of it was, I don't want to say bullshit, but uh, maybe not as interesting as I thought it was maybe a little bit. So I'm just personally trying to find the right balance between indeed summarizing, sharing, having a way that the content can be reused regardless of the implementation and implementation, just sharing my perspective there. That is a very important perspective and it is very important to share. And I think we're all very different in this. And for this particular community, my job as quote unquote editor is to try to create an environment we, where we're comfortable with different levels like Adam, he will not write. Fine, I steal from Twitter, put it in the journal and he approves it, hopefully. Well, so far he has. So, you know, if you wanna write, write, but also, I really share so strongly the mental thing you talked about. We can't know what it's like to use something until it exists. And we say, if an idea is important, write it down, because writing it down, of course, helps clarifying. But that's only if it's that kind of an idea. Implementing in demos and code is as important. I've been lucky enough to be involved with building our summer house in Norway and doing a renovation here. And because it's a physical environment, even doing it in SketchUp is not enough. You know, I, I made many mistakes. Thankfully, there were experienced people who could help me see it in, in the real thing. Sometimes we had to put boards up in a room to see what it would feel like. So, so yeah, we, our imaginations are hugely constrained. So it's now 19 past and Brendel was suggesting he had to go somewhere else. I think it's okay with a small group if we finish half past considering this will be transcribed anyway. And um, so let's have a good weekend unless someone wants a further topic discussion, which I'm totally happy with also. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting on Monday. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I will read through what you uh, sent to the to the group that you discussed things with uh, today. I think yeah, uh, connecting people, connecting to people with problems um, that are more than graphical I've, and and more than sort of pretensions to the metaverse. I think is really fascinating because uh, uh, as uh, providing they have the imagination uh, to be able to see that what they are talking about is a is a docuverse is is these these sort of connected concepts that. Um, that that uh, Bob has written about. Uh, uh, I've got a book, but it's on the coffee table. Um, the, the the pages after two hundred and forty four. So um, the characterization of the actual information and decision spaces that you have on. Yes, yes. So on uh, page uh, two four six seven. Um, the the, uh, the it's got the person with the HMD, but then it's sort of situated in in an organization. Where there are there are flows of decisions, and I think that that recognizing that that we can do work on that is is, is fascinating. That's the one. Yes, I just yeah, think, I, mean, I think that's so. I can send that to everybody if you like. Oh, I have it, but yes, yeah, please, I have it too. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, so w without naming names or exactly who I was speaking to today, since we're still recording. Um, the interesting things is, of course, this feeds the okay, starting with the visual meta, it feeds into some part of the organization desperately wants something like that. And they've been pushing for years, but there's resources and organization and communication, all those real world issues. So then a huge problem is I come in as an outsider and I say, hey, here's a solution. It's really cheap and simple. It's kind of like I'm stealing their thunder. Right? I am not doing that. I'm just trying to help them realize what they already want to do. And today, when they talked about different standards, I said, look, honestly, what's in visual meta, I don't care. If you could please put it in BibTech, the basic stuff, but if you want to have some JSON in there, it's not something I would like, but if you want to do it, there's nothing wrong with that. So mm -hmm. to try to make these people feel that they are being enabled rather than someone kind of moving them along is emotionally human difficult. And also for them to feel that they're doing something with Vint Surf, you know, all of that hopefully will help them feel a bit of excitement. But I yes. also think that the incredibly hard issues with the metaverse that we're bringing up also unlock something in their imagination. Because imagine if we, at the end of this year, we have a demo where we have a printed document 
And then we pretend to do OCR. We don't need to do it live, right? And then we have it on the computer. Very nice. And now suddenly we put on a headset. You, you all know where I'm going with this, right? We have that thing. But then as the crucial question you kept asking um, Gavin, and I'm glad you both asked it, um, Fabian and Brandel, what happens to the room when you leave it? You know, what happens to the artifacts and the relationship? If we solve some of that, what an incredibly strong demo that would be. And also, was it a little bit of a wake up call for you guys to see that this well funded new company is still dealing with only rectangles? No, I, I, I know from my own internal experience just how, um, how coarse the thinking is um, with even better funding. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, the, the greatest thing about our group is we have zero funding and we have zero bosses. You know, all we have is our honesty, community, and passion. No, it's a very different place to invent from. But look at all the great inventions. Look, you know, Vint was a graduate student. Tim Berners-Lee was trying to do something at a different lab. You know, you know all the stories. Uh, great innovations have to come from groups like this. I don't know if we're going to invent something. I don't know. I don't really care. But I really do care desperately that we contribute to the dialogue. Yeah, I think that's valuable. And I, I think that the 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 fact that, that we have your perspective on visual forms of important distilled information Bob, is going to be really valuable. And one of the things I'd like to do, given that you said that so many people make use of Vision 2050, is uh, is is start with that as a sculpture, uh, as a as a system to to be able to jump into further detail. Do you have more on that one? I know. So Nyrex is well. I can. Uh, I can. You know, I can take it apart. I can take, you know, do what, what different things we want to do with it. For example, mm -hmm. uh, when we were clearing it, it with the team that worked, that, that, that cre you know, that created some of the thought that went into it, the back casting mm -hmm. uh, thought, um, I would send the, the, the long uh, trail of the, the four decades, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of, um, transportation to mm -hmm. Boeing, to Volkswagen, and to Toyota. I didn't send it to the rest of the people. So I could take that, I actually took that out and sent a PDF of that, only that to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's, that's one dimension. Another dimension is that uh, five years later, uh, we, I worked on, a, on another project that was similar called Pull Free, which is also on my website. Uh, and uh, it narrowed the, um, the, the, the focus to uh, Europe, to the uh -huh. European Union, uh, rather than the whole world. But the structure is similar in many ways. Um, so, you know, so, so each one of those are extractable. Then also, uh, I have a few, you know, at the, the, the two or three years after uh, working on the Vision 2050, uh, I would give lectures of different kinds. And um, people would ask me, well, how are we doing on, on this or that requirement? <laughs> and so I would try to pull up uh, whatever data there was two or three or four years later, and put that in my slides. Um, so, you know, there, that material is available so that we can extract, you can, could demo at least that uh, here's what we thought in 2010, and here's what it looked like in 2014 for one, for one small chunk of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the, 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 the whole picture. So, yeah, and, and you know, and I have several, you know, maybe, I don't know, six or eight at least of those that, that where I could find, you know, data easily and fast. Uh, so, you know, so there's, there's demo, there's a bit of demo material there, uh, you know, that one, that one could, could portray a uh, different, different kind of a landscape than the one that you were, you know, pointed out yes. uh, just a minute ago. 
So that yeah, you know, no, that's that, what that I sounds- can do. Um, yeah, that that would be really interesting to play with. Um, I, I just I was looking to at some of the things. I think that the I had the one thing that I had seen of the Vision Twenty Fifty was the fairly simple one. There's, there's a it's a sort of a four it, this this um, node graph here. The nine billion people live well uh, and within the limits of the planet. I hadn't I hadn't seen yet the the sustainable pathway toward a sustainable Twenty Fifty document that you linked here uh, on your on your site um, which is, has a ton more information um, and yeah one of the things that I'm curious about what what one of the things that I think I will do to play with it first is actually get it into a, not into a program but not into a program that I write but into a 3d modeling app to sort of tear it apart and, and think about the way in which we might be able to kind of create and distribute a space for it do you but but first do you have thoughts about what you would do? If this was an entire room, um, you know, it's it's it obviously needs to be a pretty big uh, uh, mural. But if it was an entire room or an entire building, what do you have a sense of the the way in which it would differ? Great question. <laughs> uh, you know, I I until you ask the question and put it together uh, with uh, with the, the pages from the the old book. Um, hmm. I, I haven't really thought of that, um, uh, but um, the you know f- f- from many of the from many of the places in uh, Vision Twenty Fifty, one yes. would one would have pathways like this. Yeah. This this is this this was uh, originally a perch chart uh, way back when uh, that I was visualizing because. Because I happen to have early in my career edited a book on pert charts <laughs> for for Dupont, and um, uh, so uh, that's a that's a, a really intriguing question. Um, uh, wow! I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, yeah. So go ahead. Would be extracting and and laying it out and then connecting those uh in other words and also flipping flipping the uh the 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 big mural of the the time-based mural um in vision uh, vision 2050 making that flat bringing bringing different parts of it up i Hmm. think would be one of the first ways that one would try to explore that because then one yeah. could make uh, pathways uh, and 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 alternatives and 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 then linkages. So they're yeah. they're, they're different uh, depending on one's purpose, one's thinking purpose. One would do different things. Yes. Yeah. Brief, brief note there. Um, if I, I believe you're using Illustrator to make the visuals. Yes. Yeah, yes. uh, I, I believe Illustrator can also save to SVG, uh, and SVG then can be relatively easily extruded to transform a 2D shape to a 3D shape. Honestly, doing that would be probably interesting, but very, very basic or very naive. Uh, it's still, I think, a good step to let's say extrude part of a graph with different depths based on, I don't know, color or meaning or position or something like this. So I think it could be done. If you could export one of the uh, poster in that format in SVG, I think it would be fun to tinker with. But I think at some point you personally will have to uh, to consider indeed the, the question that Brenda will ask is if you had a room rather than a wall uh, yeah. and beyond the automatic uh, extraction or extrusion, how would you design it? Yeah, it's something that I think will be really useful uh, as an exercise if you want to go through one of those murals and, and, and with a sketchbook, just pencils. Uh, and, and at some point uh, you can go through it with us to sort of characterize what I think, uh, a, like you said, uh, like different shapes, different jobs call for different shapes through that space. But one, you know, we, we, can, we can move space around, which is exciting. Your librarians can move their walls around. Um, oh, and, yeah. and I was gonna say the other, you, you strike uh, another chord, you know, uh, just as from the demonstration we saw earlier this morning, 
uh, the, the big mural could be on one wall. Uh, there was a written report. You know, there is a 60 or 80 page report uh, that could be linked in various ways to it. Uh, and it exists. Uh, and uh, then there's also in that report, there's a kind of simplification of the, of the big mural. It, uh -huh. it reduces the 800 uh, uh, steps in the, in the mural to about 40. And it's a visual, it's a visual table kind of look. So already there are three views, uh, three walls, all right. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and we've already imagined putting it flat and on the floor and, and things popping up from it. All right, there we go. There's a room for you. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah, no, I think that that's that's a, a really good start. And from my from from my perspective, I think that that's something that I, I can and, and will play with is is uh, starting from that 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 JPEG of the of the PDF. Um, mm -hmm. I'll I'll sort of peel pieces of that off and try to arrange them in space, thinking about some of the stuff that that um, Fabian's done with the visual meta, uh, virtual visual meta, as well as what um, Adams succeeded in doing uh, in, in terms of pulling the dates off because I think that yeah there there's some really interesting sort of um, duality of views like multiplicity of representations that we can kind of get into as well as being able to leverage the idea of having vastly different scales you know when when you have a at Apple we call it a type matrix but just you know the the the, the texts and what what's a heading what's a subhead um, you know but the thing is that. Uh, except in the most egregious cases, which we sometimes do at Apple, um, the, the the biggest text is no more than about five times the smallest text. But in real space, you can have a museum, and the, the letters on the museum wall yes. or in a big room is th are this big, and then you have little blocks like that big. And yes. there's no expectation for there to be mutually intelligible. You, there's no way you can read this while you're reading that. Um, but because of the fact that we have the ability to navigate that space, we can make use of those incredibly disparate scales. And I think that's sort of incumbent on us to, to, to reimagine what we would do with those vastly different scales uh, that we have available as a result of, you know, uh, being able to locomote through a, a virtual space. Well, tell me, you know, uh, let me know if you need uh, any of these things. I can provide uh, somehow, I guess you and I could figure out how to do a drop yeah. box for, for illustrator or or yeah. any you know other other sure. yeah, I, I, useful I, for you yeah no thank you I, I i may ask for the illustrator document one of the things that i've been recently inspired by so there's a there's an incredible team at apple that i'm trying to, to apply for uh, called prototyping and one of the neat things that they have done um over the years is, is describe their prototyping process and it mostly involves cutting jpegs apart and throwing them into the roughest thing possible uh, in order to be able to answer the coarsest questions possible first. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to doing something coarse grained uh, with the expectation that we have a better sense of what it is we would want to do with more high fidelity resources. So um, ho hopefully that will bear fruit and, 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 and nobody should be hopefully no, uh, too, too distraught by misuse of the material, but but, uh, but I, I, I very much enjoy the idea of taking fairly rough hand to these broad, broad questions at first and, and then uh, making sure that refinement is based on actual resolution in the sense of being resolved rather than in pixel density. Yeah, well, okay, if you want JPEGs, we can make JPEGs too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you said almost as a throwaway thing there, uh, Traverse. But one thing that I learned, Brandel, particularly with your first mural of Bob's work is uh -huh. that uh, traversal, unless you're physically walking, if you have room scale opportunity, is horrible. Yes. But being able to pull and push is wonderful. Yes. And I think that kind of insight that we're learning by doing is something we really should try to record. So I'm not trying to push you into an article, but if you have a few bullets <laughs> you want to put into Twitter or send to me or whatever, you know, as in this is in your experience has caused stomach pain. This hasn't, because yeah. also yesterday I saw a. Um, so you know, I come from a visual background. I have photography friends and do videos and all of that stuff. Um, suddenly, a, a friend of mine, Keith, whom some of you have met, we were in Soho where he put a 
8K 360 camera and it was really fun. So I got all excited, went home, looked up a few things, and then I found the stereo 180 cameras. And I finally found a way to view it on the Oculus. It was a bit clunky, but I did. And it was an awful experience. There, there's something about where you place your eye. You know, when we saw the movie Avatar, it was really weird that the bit that is blurry could actually would actually be sharp as well, but somewhere else, you know, th those kinds of effects. So to have a, the stereoscopic, if it isn't exactly right on both eyes and you're looking at the exact, it's horrible. So these are the things we're learning. And it, it, if we could put it into a more listy way, that would be great. Anyway, just since you mentioned. Yes, no, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And that's something that uh, Mark uh, Anderson also um, observed when he realized that unfortunately um, the the Fresnel lenses that we make use of in, in current gen, generation hardware means that um, it, you're not, it's not particularly amenable to looking with your eyes like that. You really have to be looking through the center of your headset uh, in order to be able to get the best view. You have this sense of the periphery, but woe betide anybody who tries to read stuff down there because their eyes are going to start hurting. Yeah. I still have problems getting a real good sharp focus. Yes, yeah. No. Jiggle this, jiggle that, but you know, hey, early days. Right, so when it comes to what we're talking about with Bob's mural and the levels and the connections and all of that good stuff, it seems to be an incredible, useful thing to experiment with, with exactly these issues. You know, what, what does it actually mean to explode it, et cetera? So yeah, very good. Great. Just put a link well, there, Fabian, opening. Yeah, uh, I, I imagine that being shared before, but just in case, uh, Mike Algier, who is, um, well, at least who was, I'm not sure right now, but a uh, typist and designer at Google on the mm -hmm. few XR product, wrote some uh, design principle a couple of years ago. Um, and none of, I mean, not all of these were his, but he illustrated it quite nicely. So I think it's a, it's a good uh, summary. Yes, I agree. No, he, he's still at Google. He was working on Earth and YouTube. Uh, so uh, working on how to how to present media and make sure that it uh, sort of um, works seamlessly so that you're not you're not lying about what the media is. But in, ter in terms of um, not not like, you know, but in terms of um, sort of presenting a YouTube video in VR in a way that it isn't with you know, I don't know, like a CRT screen or whatever. Um, but also making sure that it's something that you can kind of um, interact with uh, as seamlessly as possible. So it's it's, it's nice work, uh, and hopefully, if uh, Google sort of ramps up its work back into AR VR, um, then they can leverage his abilities uh, because they've lost a lot of a lot of people who are doing really interesting things. Um, I don't know if you saw Don McCurdy has now moved to New York Times to work on 3D stuff there, and that's very exciting for them, but a huge blow for for Google not to have them back. So, yeah. Just adding this to um, our little news thing. Right, excellent. Yeah, so good. So, right, yeah, let's uh, reconvene on Monday. This is good. And, um, yeah, that's all just wonderful, really. Have a good weekend. Have a lovely weekend. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.